Um, I've been personally going through a course of teachings um, by a man called Lance Woolnow. And uh, the, the course is called um, Breaking the Power of Controlling Spirits. And he's dealing with breaking the power of controlling spirits off of our lives, but also breaking the power of controlling spirits uh, off of churches and off of communities. And the basic premise, by the way, if you want to have the authority to break the power of controlling spirits uh, off people and off situations, uh, you must first and foremost break the power of controlling spirits off yourself. Um, and uh, we started, um, so I've been basing my teachings off uh, the series by Lance Woolnow. I've been inspired by what he's been sharing. And we started to look at uh, the first lesson on Wednesday night. Um, so if I could just ask, let's just open our Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 11. Can I get you to sit with your friend just to help her out this morning too? Over here. Uh, where's Gore Ping this morning? Is she okay? Is she feeling okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to pray for Gore Ping. Um, uh, she has uh, been struggling through the whole thing of um, she's fighting with cancer and uh, going through chemo and all the different things. Um, so I just want to lift her up. Father, I do pray for Gorping this morning that you would strengthen her uh, in her inner man and even within her body by your mighty power, that you would empower her and strengthen her with hope, that you would empower her and strengthen her, Lord, um, just with joy even this morning. Uh, Lord, I just pray that, uh, that you would encounter her this morning, that she'd feel your presence and know your presence. And Lord, I ask that you would work this situation in her life around for your kingdom purpose and your kingdom good. In Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Okay, so we're looking um, in Luke chapter 11. And I want to look at one verse in particular. Um, verse, well, let's look verse 14 through to 26. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, It's by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that he is driving out demons. Others tested him by asking for signs from heaven, a sign from heaven. You just cast out a demon, they're asking for a sign. You know, like, wake up. Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said to them, Any kingdom that's divided against itself will come to ruin. A house that's divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? I say this because you claim that I'm driving demons out by the power of Beelzebub. Now, if I drive demons out by the power of Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. But if I drive demons out by the finger of God, then you will know that the kingdom of God has come to you. When a strong man who is fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe, but when someone stronger than him attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted, and he divides up the spoil. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Mm -hmm. So Jesus, in fact, if you study the Gospels, around one third of the total ministry of Jesus Christ is dealing with demonic spirits. Okay, so we're not talking about his teaching ministry, but the active ministry of where he's out there healing and ministering to people. One third 
of Jesus' ministry is dealing with demonic spirits. Um, in the book of 1 John, it declares about Jesus, uh, For this purpose the Son of Man is manifest to destroy the works of the devil. Um, and so Jesus makes a very interesting claim here. Um, he says that he is driving demons out by the finger of God. And so God is pointing his finger at a demon and Jesus goes, okay, that one, and he goes after that one. So it is by the finger of God. God's finger is more powerful than demons. And he says, uh, also it goes in Matthew, he says, if I drive out demons by the spirit of God or the power of God, and so those concepts are together, the finger of God, the spirit of God, the power of God. But Jesus said this, when you see me driving demons out, then you know that is your sign the kingdom of heaven is manifesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, so this is a very interesting thing. If we want to see the kingdom of heaven manifest in our lives, in the church, in our city... Uh, we, we need to see spiritual warfare. We need to see demons being confronted and driven out. Amen. Uh, that's his words. That's not my words. That's not my opinion. I argue with Jesus. Jesus says, when you see me driving out spirits by the finger of God, you know that the kingdom of God's come. And then he talks about the strong man. And obviously the strong man is dealing with the demon. And the strong man is... Fully armed and he's guarding his house. Uh, his house is what we call the stronghold. It's his fortress, uh, the fortress in which demonic powers gain control over a territory. They get a stronghold on the territory from that fortress. Uh, but the stronghold of the enemy is also his prison. His prison where he takes the souls of men captive. Hearts and minds and lives are taken captive. And so Jesus is dealing with a strong man guarding his stronghold. When he's fully armed, his possessions are safe. So what has to happen, we have to disarm the strong man. And he goes on, when someone stronger than the strong man attacks. And we know Jesus is speaking of himself. Jesus is the one who is stronger than the strong man. And the one who is stronger than the strong man, when he attacks... And he overpowers that strong man. He will take from the strong man his armor, his weapons in which that strong man trusts. And then he will go and plunder the strong man's house and he's going to divide up the spoil. And so Jesus manifests in the earth to bind up and disarm demonic strong men, to come into the strongholds of the enemy, to conquer them, destroy them, and set the captives free. Jesus has come like a wrecking ball to, to wreck the powers of darkness. And then Jesus goes on, If you are not with me in this ministry, you're against me. I want to throw that in there. We need to join Jesus in the ministry of disarming, binding up demonic strong men, driving them out of situations and destroying their strongholds and setting the captives free. Amen. So Jesus says, if you're not for me in this ministry, if you're opposing this type of ministry, then you're actually against me. Um, and so we, we start with that concept. Now, on Wednesday night, we're also looking at the book of Luke, uh, chapter 21. And I just want to start with uh, this as... A revision, because not all, everyone's there on Wednesday nights. Luke 21, verse 25 to 28. Chapter 21, verse 25 to 28. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. They're all asking for a sign, so Jesus gives them. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roar and the tossing of the sea. Men's hearts will fail them for terror, apprehensive about what is coming upon the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And at that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with His great power and glory. When these things take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. 
And so this is uh, one of our key scriptures for the series of teaching on breaking the power of controlling spirits. And we have an example of the most intense time of human history. And we're going to use that example of the most intense time, not just for human history, but for the people of God. In regards to the great tribulation, the great testing. And we're going to use that as an example for us today as we go through our trials, our testings, our tribulations. So we're going to look at the big event as an example, because we've got minor events that we go through. Um, but there is these events that take place, and uh, Jesus speaks of this time, and he says in Luke 21, he says, There never has been a time in human history that has ever been so terrifying and intense. And there never will be again in human history a time that is so terrifying and intense. So as, as intense history has been, as intense as you think your life can become, uh, it, there, there is a time coming that will be even more intense. And so we're talking about this time and the example, the words of Jesus to his people, how to endure through this time, how to overcome this time, and we want to take his words for us today. Yeah. How to overcome. And, uh, and so Jesus is saying this time will be so intense. And he's already said, when these things come upon the world, uh, do not fear. Do not fear because you know what I'm doing. You see what the devil's doing. You see what the Antichrist is doing. You see uh, the whole world is in turmoil and crisis, but you don't need to fear my people because you see beyond the crisis, you see beyond the tribulation, and you know what I am doing behind the scenes. Yeah. And so he says, in this time, men's hearts will fail them for fear. It's going to be so intense, literally people are going to have heart attacks. They're going to have panic attacks. Their fear and worry and anxiety takes over their lives. But he also goes on, he says, uh, the heavenly powers will be shaken. That's the, the literal translation. And, and that's what we were looking at on Wednesday night. In this time of great tribulation, God is doing something in the earth. It's actually, the, the purpose is God is bringing judgment on the powers of darkness. So the, the powers of darkness that are seated on their thrones in the midst of the great tribulation... Uh, those powers are being shaken and they're being dethroned. And it's very similar to the story we have in Exodus when God sends Moses into Egypt to set his people free from bondage in Egypt. And Pharaoh says no. And so then there begins a great uh, power struggle over Egypt. And this power struggle with spiritual power confrontations, and God is unleashing judgments over Egypt. And that's a picture of what's going to happen at the last days. But when you see this scenario, and God said to Moses, before it all began, and God said, well, a Pharaoh won't instantly easily set the captives free. He, 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 will, he will resist you. He'll resist me. Uh, he, he will not release the captives. Therefore, there is going to be a major fight that's going to have to take place. And, and so the power of God working through Moses against the power of the demonic working through Pharaoh, and that's the end time scenario. Pharaoh represents the Antichrist. But the thing is, God says, I am going to do this because I'm going to judge the gods of Egypt. And the gods of Egypt, we know, the ruling powers on the thrones over Egypt were demonic powers. And there are ruling powers on thrones and they rule over people's lives, they rule over cities, they rule over nations. And in order for them to be dethroned, there has to be a major power confrontation. And in the midst of that, while God is judging the powers of darkness, the powers of darkness will rage against the people of God. And so that brings us to the book of Revelation chapter 12. And in Revelation chapter 12, it talks about there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels 
were warring against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels, the dragon being Satan, and the, his angels are the demonic powers. Michael and his good angels is warring against the dragon and his demonic powers that follow him. And then it says that the dragon and his demonic powers were not strong enough and they lost in the heavenly war and they were cast down from their place in heaven. Their, their heavenly thrones, they were cast down to the earth. And that's a time yet to come in its fullness. And, and then it goes on in the chapter and it says, Because this dragon has now been cast down, he knows his time is short. Mm. He knows my time is short. And so then he rages with a great rage against the people of God. So I'm trying to open your eyes to principles of spiritual warfare. You see, in life, when we are moving towards our breakthrough, when we're moving towards um, promotion in God, when we are moving towards a place that threatens the powers of darkness, and the powers of darkness then, because spiritual warfare breaks out, and the powers of darkness, their thrones start to shake. Their, their authority starts to shake. They're going to fall from their authority. They're going to lose authority. And so when that shaking takes place, and I'm not just talking about the end times, I'm talking about over our lives, over our situations, when the enemy knows he is going to lose authority, then he starts to rage. Yes. He starts to, because we, we talked about this on Wednesday, one of the key emotions behind most anger issues is fear. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you've got to understand, as it was in Egypt, Pharaoh feared that the people of God would join his enemy. When his enemy comes to wage war against him, and then the people of God would defeat uh, Egypt and break its power. And it says that in Exodus chapter 2 and chapter 1. And, and so just like that, demonic powers are fearing the people of God arising. Mm. They're fearing the people of God laying hold of the fullness of their inheritance. Right, yeah. Demonic powers, when they see us starting to rise up, right, yeah. there is an emotion of fear. And, you know, Satan fears you finding out who you are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Satan fears you walking in the fullness of your purpose and your destiny. Mm. Demonic powers, as it was in Egypt, Pharaoh didn't want to lose his slaves. Mm. Because his slaves, the people of God, were building demonic strongholds. That's you read yes. what's going on. Yeah. The people of God were building the treasure cities or the stronghold treasure cities of Egypt. You know, the whole thing, the, the world system and the system of mammon and everything's about, you know, let's get famous, let's be prosperous. And it's the people of God don't realize it, but they're bound by the hard taskmasters of the demonic powers who drive them, I've got to make more money. Yeah. I need to get a better job. Yeah. I need a new car. We need to buy a house. And all of these strategies, because the strategy of Pharaoh in Egypt was to distract the people of God from rising up and joining the enemy of Egypt, who represents Jesus, the enemy of the demonic powers. So distract them with the slave masters who drive them, I need to make more money, I need to become more successful in the world, I need to run after this and I need to run after that. And so they don't actually rise up, they get bound and captive. So to break the power of controlling spirits, we first must identify that there are controlling spirits that have some form of control over our lives. Mm. Unless you realize that there is a, a prison that has you bound in a certain area of your life, or, a, or there is a controlling, driving spirit that can drive you and distract you from the things of God and drive you into a certain way of living, if you don't recognize that you're being driven by these spirits, you'll never get set free. Mm. And this is the first thing. We've got, to, we've got to recognize where we've been captive, where we've been distracted, and controlling spirits are driving us. Because until we recognize that, we cannot dethrone them. So in, in uh, Luke chapter 21, dealing with the end times, it says, When all hell breaks loose, and everyone else is having heart attacks and they're freaking out. They're having panic attacks and they're worried because they're running around. 
You know, oh, I need more money. Oh, I need this. I need that. Oh, my bank account just disappeared. The world economy's crashed. You know, where am I going to get lunch? And whatever it is. But, but they're all running around because the things of the world are being shaken and falling apart. But for us, the people of God, we don't need to fear. In fact, when, when, when all hell breaks loose in a situation, we can lift up our heads, focus on the Lord, the Lord of the angel armies, the Lord who's sitting on the unshakable throne, the one who has power and authority over all the powers of darkness. He conquered them by the cross. And we lift up our heads and we focus on Him and we know our redemption or our salvation is near. Mm. Not just talking about the second coming. That's just a, that's an example for us. But the thing is, the Lord Jesus, by the power of His kingdom, is about to break into our situation in a very powerful way. And when He breaks into our situation, we are about to join Him in a very powerful way. And then in a very powerful way, we are going to conquer crush powers of darkness, blind strong men, set the captives free. There's going to be deliverance of God breaking out. We're on the brink of this breakthrough, but now the devil is raging to stop us breaking through. Mm. The devil is saying, don't lift up your head. Yeah. Don't focus on the Lord. Don't press into God. Yeah. Press into making more money. Yeah. Press into getting a promotion at work. Press into becoming more successful in life. No. Distracting us with all these other things. So then the, what happens when we press into those things, we're focused on the wrong thing, and that empowers fear and worry to increase. Yeah. So this is, a, this is one of the ways controlling spirits control. Yeah. But the answer is, Jesus said, don't fear, lift up your head. You've got to know your redemption is near. Hallelujah. Also, Luke 21, a very strong and key verse for what we're looking at. We've got it up on the board. Possess your soul. Possess your soul is the key theme I want to look at this morning. Possess your soul. Luke 21, uh, verse 19. The NIV, I use the NIV. This is an NIV here. Um, the NIV translates certain verses and passages much better than the King James. But the King James translates other passages much better than the NIV. Okay. So, I was a Bible translator. I've got both. I've got a King James at home, I've got an NIV, and I've got other. So, um, the thing is, uh, Holy Spirit speaks spirit. Listen to that. But here it says, in the NIV, by standing firm, you'll gain life. By standing firm, you will gain life. Okay? Very, very weak translation. If you have a new King James that says, Persevere, when all this hell is breaking loose, persevere and possess your soul. Mm -hmm. Take possession of your soul. See, this is dealing with controlling spirits. They want, there's war raging over your heart and mind. There's war raging over your conscience. That's your soul. Demonic powers are wanting to possess your soul, your heart and your mind. So we've got that up on the board there. Your heart and your mind. Demonic powers, if they can possess your soul, they will be able to control you, manipulate you, and defeat you. So what we need to do in the spiritual warfare is we've got to learn how to stand firm and possess our own soul in a sense that we bring our heart and mind to the Lord and let Him possess it. Amen, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah. Now, the, the Greek word that's used here uh, for persevere. Okay, the Greek word that's used for persevere is hupomeno. I'll write this up here. Hupo meno. Okay. Now, hupo literally means to bear or to endure while you are under great pressure. Oh, wow. okay. So there's great pressure on you and you are going to endure and, and persevere. And the, and the meno means basically to, like, to stand your ground. Okay? 
So, those that have researched Greek language, um, they say, hupomeno means to have a resolute commitment not to retreat. Mm. When all hell breaks loose against you, when there's all of this pressure on you, I will stand my ground and I will not retreat. Hupomeno, uh, it also uh, means it's a person who is under some type of great load and they refuse to uh, stray from the position that they've been called to. In other words, God has called you into an arena. God has called you to stand in a certain battleground. He says, this is your battleground. You know, when you're married, that's your battleground. It's one of my definitions of marriage, the warfare zone. Uh, but you're not supposed to fight your spouse, you're supposed to fight the devil. The devil's plan is to fight your spouse. You know, the devil sits back, his husband and wife fight each other, he gets popcorn and Coca-Cola and watches the show. <laughs> Remember when, when Hume and I, we were having those problems when we first got married, we're both lions and we're both, we're both almost killing each other. And uh, the, the pastor that was giving us marriage counselling says, you, you're both lions, you know, you're... Your personality type, you're both high D for dominance and control, and you're both these lying personalities. Um, he said, you're either going to kill each other, or you're going to learn how to stand together and fight together against the enemy, and you'll be the devil's nightmare. Mm -hmm. And now, can you imagine the devil's just brought his popcorn and Coca-Cola, he's sitting down for the show, and then suddenly the husband and wife turn around and look at him in the eyes, and then we say, we're after you. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Become the devil's nightmare. Yeah. So, um, a resolve to stand your ground, whatever it got, family, uh, uh, whatever God has called you into in regards to His calling, His ministry. You know, when you're an intern and you made a commitment into your internship, then you stand your ground and you follow through with your commitment. You know why? Wherever you make commitments to the Lord, Satan and demonic powers come in to get you to break your commitment. Whenever you make a vow or a commitment, that's why a marriage vow, Satan hates covenants. He comes to destroy a covenant. Know that the, that the enemy wars against your commitments, especially the commitments you've made in the Lord. Mm. So he'll do everything he can to get you to back off from that battleground. <clears throat> mm. That's very interesting because this word, uh, hupomeno, from the Greek, um, one of the understandings from the Greek was this, is the Greek and the Roman soldiers, if you were to look at the shoes that they wear when they go into battle, they're kind of like, you know, soccer boots. You've all seen soccer boots, right? You know how soccer boots and football boots, they have those tags underneath. Mm. So the idea is that when they're running around the field, they don't constantly slip over, especially when it's been raining. You know, it's nothing worse than slipping over with, you know, um, you lose your footing, okay? Well, in the ancient world, the Roman and the Greek armies literally had steel spikes. When they march in the battle, because their shoes were also weapons. Because they would march in lines and they would march over their enemies. And by the time, the, the, by the time, time an army of several hundred soldiers has marched over you, there's like this hunk of minced beef. <laughs> Just, you know, like when it says that's what it says, you know, soon the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. There is a, there is, we're going to make mincemeat of demons. It's like going to be demon mince, you know. But the thing was, this picture 